Coming up on episode 48 of Create If Writing, we're talking about how to identify your current audience. I can't go back to sleep, it's almost light. These restless thoughts have kept me up again. Hello and welcome to episode 48 of Create If Writing, and this is the podcast for writers and bloggers who are trying to build an online platform without being smarmy. I'm your host, Kirsten Oliphant, and I am so glad that you are listening today. Before I get into this episode and help you identify your current readers, which is something I'm so excited about, I wanted to kind of catch you up on what's going on in our overall community and with creative writing. So this is part three of a series on finding your perfect audience or FIPA. I don't remember how I've pronounced this in the past. So clearly this is not a hashtag or name that's going to catch on. But finding your perfect audience is something that's really important. It helps you have clarity and cohesion to your message. So we've talked about your why and figuring out why you're doing what you're doing because that's really important to know your purposes, to think about your ideal readers. I helped you last week in episode 47, create an ideal reader profile. And I gave you guys like a 10 page freebie that you can download anytime at creativewriting.com forward slash 047 to identify and kind of create a reader profile for the people you actually want to read your blog. And this week, we're going to be talking about something that's going to be super exciting for those of you who are analytical and like looking at data. And I don't like that, but I still find this really fun. But we're going to talk about how to identify the current readers that you actually have. Because unless you haven't launched, you already have current readers. Maybe you have 50, maybe you have 5,000. But either way, I'm going to give you guys some tools to help you figure out who those people are, get to know them better. And also what to do if your current readers do not match up with the ideal profile that you created. This has been kind of a crazy month for me coming off of the Profitable Blogging Summit and moving right into summer where I have four kids all at home and no work days. And I don't know what's going on with bedtime. I don't know. Parents out there, are your kids crazy at bedtime in summer? We haven't changed much about our schedule other than we're playing really hard and outside and they should be tired, but they're going to bed later and getting up just as early and I'm exhausted. So at night, which is now my only work time because my days are pretty much gone, I just kind of want to binge watch Netflix and not record podcasts and do other things. So it's been really difficult for me. I don't know what your pace is like in the summer, but it's I have a lot of things to do and I'm trying to pull back and also needing to pull back, but it's really hard because my brain hasn't stopped moving and I have great ideas and things I want to do. And I'm about to launch a book next week. So look out for that. I'll be talking about it. It's email lists made easy for writers and bloggers. And I probably don't need to describe it because the title says it all, but it's a book that's going to help walk you through some of the things that I have found to be vitally important and that other people have found to be vitally important. So that whether you are just starting out with your list or haven't started a list, or you're trying to get your list to actually work for you, this book is going to have a lot of details that walk you through all the steps of email from content to creation to getting signups and blog or email growth. So that's one thing that's happening. (laughs) Something that's very exciting is after this month where we're talking about finding your perfect audience, I am going to have some repurposed content on the podcast. And I could not be more excited. Last summer, I took a job working for Business to Blogger and I was the host of their podcast. And I got to interview some really amazing people like Amy Lynn Andrews and Bjork and Lindsay Ostrom and just a a number of really great people. So those were more geared towards straight up blogging and for people who are working at kind of either becoming profitable bloggers or full-time bloggers. But in any case, Business of Blogger has actually shut down and I am getting to repurpose those podcasts because they're gone over there here. I don't know that I'll use all of them. So I'm actually going back through and kind of updating things and I'll do an intro for each one that's 
current, but you guys are going to benefit from hearing some really great interviews with some fantastic people. And that's kind of what I'm going to do for the summer because I've realized that interviews, basically I can't do them right now. My, my schedule just does not allow for it. And even doing these solo episodes has been really a beast. Yeah, summertime, summertime. <laughs> that's just how it is around here. So I want to dive in now to the main content. And I talked last week, how I didn't want to keep saying meat. That was the word that came to mind. And I had some other good sh- suggestions, but I didn't land on one yet. So yes, we're diving into the main portion of the podcast. So I want to talk to you guys about how to identify your current audience. Now, there are three main ways that you can do this. And I'm going to go through each of them in a little bit of detail. And the first is analytics. The second is surveying, and the third is talking to people, actually talking to them. So these are the three ways that you're going to get to know your current audience, and you can use all, a combination thereof, two out of three. I think the third one is the one people are going to be most nervous about, so we'll see when we get there. But the first one is pretty obvious. It's analytics, and the nice thing is that you have, if you're on social media, if you have a blog, you have access to analytics out the wazoo. Now, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully you have Google Analytics installed on your website. And if you don't, I will leave a link in the show notes for how to do that because you need that done. And the show notes, by the way, are going to be at createifwriting.com forward slash 048. So I will leave a link to how to get that installed. Another side note about Google Analytics, if you ever find that your bounce rate is like 10% or lower, you may have Google Analytics installed twice on your site. So it's a good idea to, if you're putting code anywhere, I mean, Google Analytics is pretty specific about where you should put it, but people sometimes just stick things places. I use Genesis frameworks for my blogs because it makes it really easy on a lot of levels. But one of the things they have is called Simple Hooks. It's a plugin. And it kind of has these blank spaces where you can go in and it says header and you just copy and paste code. It doesn't show you all the crazy codes. You're not going to go break your blog. You can copy and paste like the Google Analytics, for example, right into the area where it says head, if that's where it needs to go. And then you just plug it in. And that was really great for other things like advertising and things like that, that you may need to manually plug into your site. Simple Hooks is great for that. But if you're not using that, you may want to make a note of where you have installed things so they're not installed twice. So that's just a brief aside that if you have a like really awesome bounce rate and you're so excited, and I see this happen in Facebook groups all the time and I hate to be the one that's like, yeah, your bounce rate's not really 4% (laughs) because if it is, something is wrong. On the other hand, your bounce rate should not be 90%, which mine has been this month on my KirstenOlephant.com blog because my host has basically crashed my site for months. It's terrible. And I hadn't been paying enough attention to my analytics. So you need to pay attention to your analytics. So I'm changing hosts and I'm going to be paying more attention to analytics. So you want to have Google Analytics and why this is important. First of all, I started out on Blogger, which actually was Blogspot back in the day. Raise your hand if you started on Blogspot or Blogger or are still there. But they have kind of like these little you know, just when you're looking at your post, it tells you how many people are reading. And I used to get so excited by that until I realized that those stats are not the same and they do not match up with Google Analytics. And usually they're way higher. Google Analytics are way lower because they don't always count all of the spam bots and different non-actual readers. And I don't understand the internet well enough. I've just read people talking about this who get these things. And so there are, I guess, bots and different non- people that crawl the internet and look at sites and things like that. And so Google Analytics does not count a lot of those, whereas your blogger stats will. And the same with WordPress. Like if you have Jetpack or something like a plugin that can tell you your stats, and I still look at the Jetpack stats just to kind of get a good gauge, but for the most part, they are they are off and sometimes by a lot and sometimes by a little. So the most reliable stats you're going to get are Google Analytics. So you want to have that installed on your site. Now, Google Analytics, it's a beast. I hate it. Like I said, I I like studying things. I do not like data. (laughs) So when I go to Google Analytics, my eyes start crossing. I start sweating. It's just, I hate it. So I'm saying all this, like you need to do it and I'm needing to do it, but I hate it. So here is a secret 
if you also go into Google Analytics and freak out. There's a really great site that I'll link to in the show notes called Dashboard Junkie. And they have what are basically, they call them dashboards for Google Analytics. And they've changed some. There may be other sites like this because the ones that I have downloaded into Google Analytics, they don't have any more on Dashboard Junkie. But you may be able to find if you like just search for Google Analytics dashboards, you may find them. But what these are is basically when I go into Google Analytics and I click, you know, on the site I want to look at, because I've got a couple sites and I go to dashboards, there's something, a little tab called private. And in there I have several things that I have just uploaded from Dashboard Junkie and other places. Key blog stats, key blog stats two, personal blogger dashboard, SEO analysis. And what happens is if I click on key blog stats, for example, that doesn't have all the crazy, scary stuff that you might see when you first go into your Google Analytics dashboard. It has the basic things that bloggers tend to want to know. So on the left side, as I'm looking, it tells me how many individuals visited my blog. And it tells you that means unique visitors because Google Analytics also changed the language on that. So it can be confusing. How many unique pages were viewed? How many visits were there total visitors? how many pages were viewed in total page views. And then on the right side, it's got the most popular page, uh, the popular most popular posts, how many page views those have had. And this is for the last 30 days. And then the average time spent on that page. If you keep scrolling down, you're going to have where, what channels sent the most visitors, social, direct, where it's like people just typing in your blog name, organic search, referral from other people. And then your top 10 social networks, And then on the right side, you're going to have top referring pins, which is really awesome if you're a Pinterest user and it just tells you, um, you know, which pins and you can actually copy and paste those and look and see which of your pins are performing well. So there's more stats in that. I'm not going to keep on going, but that's key blog stats. There's another one, key blog stats two that talks about your bounce rate, your keywords, the bounce rate of your most popular content. Um, your top referring keywords and how many average time spent on your page. This is where I started to see all the red flags because I have a lot of popular content posts with zero time spent on the page. And what that's telling me, or like two seconds, whereas those posts, same posts in other places, I will see that people spend seven minutes on them. So if typically someone is reading one of my posts for seven minutes, and yet in the last 30 days, the average time spent on that post is zero. It tells you there's a big problem. So anyway, analytics are important. In any case, when you use Dashboard Junkie, you can actually get a more condensed version that's really specific. And there's a really cool one. Let me see if I can find it. Okay, on Dashboard Junkie, there's a really cool and basic visitor facts. And it's Dashboard 70 facts about your visitors. And It helps you know how many people are visiting, where do they live, what language do they speak, what device are they using, what browser are they using, what's the resolution of your display, and so on and so forth. So that could be really helpful for you knowing more about your visitors. And if you just head over to Dashboard Junkie, you can see more things. You might be really interested in some of the other things that they have. There are some gender insight. Uh, There's a gender insight dashboard, which will tell you are your web, you know, are your visitors male or female? What types of content attract which genders? Uh, are your male or female visitors most valuable and how old are they? So there's a lot of different dashboards that you could get. You can still go and Google, into Google Analytics and look at the whole mean thing if that does not stress you out. But if it does, or even if it does, you still might want one of these more um, focused dashboards so that you can actually look and kind of have a focused view of your analytics. So the things that you kind of want to pay attention to when you're looking at your blog's analytics, obviously you want to look at your most popular posts because that tells you what your readers want to read. And I also think that social is really important because Twitter traffic, for example, is different than Pinterest traffic. And I, I don't know how you guys would break this down, but I, and, and I haven't done research on you know, what what are the users like of Twitter versus Pinterest? But I think you can kind of get some idea of the behavior of those types of people. Like for me, Pinterest traffic tends to be from women and I tend to have the most traffic from Pinterest just overall. But a lot of those for, um, I'm th- primarily when I'm talking today, I'm gonna be talking about my Kirsten Oliphant blog because it's been around longer, has a lot of traffic and there's way more data. So the people reading that blog tend to read the most 
either like a how-to post, like I have a post that's done really well with SEO on how to paint walls with a brush instead of a roller, because that's how I do it. And so I have like how-to posts, some of my recipe posts have done really well. And then also a lot of my sort of inspirational parenting posts kind of about just things that are encouraging to moms have done really well. And so the traffic I think for me from Pinterest is really different than like the traffic, for example, I get from Facebook or Twitter, like my, and and you can just look, like you'll have to go and look and see, okay, what are people from Twitter clicking through to see? Because that tells you something. So when you're looking at your Google Analytics, there's a lot of information that you can pull out. Clearly, you can look at whether your visitors are male or female, what what device they're reading on, and that matters. Because again, if you're not, if you're not paying attention to kind of how your site looks on these different devices, you need to, especially if you have people who are mostly reading on a tablet or mobile and you have not paid any attention to getting your site mobile friendly, you have a problem. And that may explain something like a high bounce rate. But beyond looking at Google Analytics, you also have analytics for basically every social media site. So once you get through and maybe make some notes about the posts people are reading, where they're coming from, what they're reading on, male or female, what countries, where they go. You can, you know, you can use Google Analytics to track, okay, what did they read next? Did they leave the site? Did they go to another post? Did they sit and read four posts in a row? Which posts did they read in a row? All of those things, all that data tells you about your current readership. And then the other thing that you can do is to go into all your social platforms and Almost every single one of them has analytics. Now, if you're on Pinterest and you're not using your business account, you want to upgrade to the business account. People ask all the time about Pinterest, why business versus personal? Well, if someone goes to your Pinterest, they're not going to see a difference. It doesn't change anything. It doesn't make any big changes, except it gives you access to more free tools and you want those. If you're using Tailwind, which I I do not yet, I keep saying I'm going to set up Tailwind and Board Booster, but I have not yet. That also gives you great analytics. I think I've heard from people that Tailwind has the best analytics for Pinterest, but Pinterest has some really good ones as well that you can find out more about your Pinterest followers, what they're pinning, what they're reading, what they're interested in. So say, for example, if you have a tiny Twitter following, but a huge Pinterest following, you want to pay a lot of attention to what those people are interested in. Even if they're pinning your most popular pins that people are pinning or not from your content, that tells you what do your followers want to read about. So you can go into Pinterest, look at their analytics. You can go to Twitter and look at their analytics. You can go into Facebook if you have a page and do the page insights. And there are some really great insights in there. It's really nice that a lot of these social platforms make this free, that you can just go in and look at these kind of analytics to see more about your audience, more about what they want to read, more about how they want to read it, more about what they share. Because that all of those things can really give you a good picture of who your audience is. So that's analytics. And that's really fun for you data people. You can get super excited and make pie charts or lists or Excel spreadsheets or whatever you want to do, you data people. I like looking at it and thinking, huh, but I don't I don't do a lot of like spreadsheeting because that makes me crazy and is not fun for me at all. So use analytics how you want to use them, but definitely use them. It tells you a lot about your people. The next idea and way to get to know your current audience is by giving a survey. Now, I give at least one survey a year to my readers, and you can run these through SurveyMonkey. I really like Typeform because it's really beautiful. Google has you know, now made Google Forms. It used to be called something else, but it's you know within the Google Drive, and, and they look a lot better and actually bring in the information better than they used to, so they've updated that. But you can use any kind of survey form and ask people things. And there's some really great, I guess, resources for how to effectively run a survey. There's a great book called Ask by Ryan Levesque, and he did an interview that I'll link to in the show notes on Pat Flynn's Smart Passive Income podcast, where he talks about the different kinds of surveys. And he has a really, really specific formula, which you can try to use if you want to be really specific on how to get to know your audience. And apparently it works really, really well. It felt a little weird to me. I'm not saying I won't ever do it, but um, there's a whole book about that that kind of delves into that. And there's a really great post that I'll also link to from blog tyrant Ramsey Taplin, who I love. And he has a huge post on how to run an effective survey. So you can do them once a year, I think for sure. No matter what you're up to, 
Have a survey once a year, a reader survey. Ask your people what they think. Some people will give money away or give a prize or something for people who take the survey. I know Ryan Levesque recommends not doing that because you're going to get fewer people who just want to win something and you're going to get more honest feedback from people who care enough to take the time. But it's really up to you because you might get more data if you offer something, but you may get skewed data if you have people who are on your list who just want to win a gift card or something. However you set it up, whatever format you use, you want to directly ask your people and find out the things they want to know and then keep keep those lists. And usually with you know any of these kind of surveys, they kind of give you a really nice readout, although sometimes they put it into a spreadsheet, which makes me break out into hives. But they will give you data and you can actually look at that and say, like, here are the things that people, the majority of people really don't like or really want. And that's how I started actually the Create If Writing blog and podcast is I was writing sometimes, I got really excited about writing about writing on my Kirsten Oliphant blog. I was writing about self-publishing and how to self-publish a book. I had a whole series on that. I was super excited. And every time I gave a survey, you know, that, that blog, it really is eclectic. My tagline is an eclectic celebration of chaos and it's everywhere. It is. I talk about parenting. I talk about writing and blogging. I talk about food. I talk about faith sometimes. I talked about roller derby. It was everywhere. And my readers consistently said they liked reading about everything except writing. Now, of course, there were some people who didn't want to hear about faith and or didn't want to hear about roller derby, but they really wanted to hear about this, or some people really wanted to hear about roller derby. So you're going to have people all over the boards. But the one thing that really stood out in my content was that nobody cared about blogging and writing. And that let me know my audience was not bloggers. So if I wanted to talk about that, which I did, I needed a change. And so this I'll come back to this in the next section where I'm going to talk at the end about what to do when your current readers do not match up with your ideal. But in any case, I learned this through a survey and, and it became very clear to me that I had an issue. So definitely survey your people, use whatever format works for you, and then take that data. I'm really bad at going back through the data because again, I don't like reading spreadsheets and data, but have your virtual assistant, if you have one, piece through that stuff for you, or maybe trade off with somebody who likes spreadsheets and see if they can break it into something really pretty and you can do something in exchange for them that you like that they don't like. But in any case, do something with the data. Don't just give them a survey, actually use it. And then the third thing is actually talk to your people. Now, there are a couple of ways that you can do this. And a lot of people that I've heard suggest actually getting on the phone or doing a Skype call with people. And I know I signed up for a list recently where like the second email, the guy said, hey, hit me back and hit reply and tell me what you're struggling with and, you know, whatever. So I did because I like to test this out. I'm always testing email and see what people do. And he responded and emailed back and said he'd love to get on the phone and talk. And that just weirded me out. Now, I don't think it has to be weird to talk to people, but I wasn't like an established audience member. This was part of an autoresponder welcome series he had, and it was the second email. I didn't know this guy well enough to get on the phone with him. That felt really weird to me. So I will recommend maybe not doing this to like new, like don't do this in your welcome series unless that makes sense to you strategically. Like this is something maybe to send out to your main list and and you will have some new people on there. But like if you're sending out a weekly email and you ask that, you're probably going to get more responses from people who have been there for a while. So maybe reach for those people and not the new readers because that just, again, it was a big turnoff and it should have been a turn on except you know, because it had that great personal touch, but it was too personal for how well I knew this person. I think I unsubscribed actually from his list. It just felt weird. So if you're going to actually take this step and talk to people, you want to make sure it's people that you have a real relationship with already. Like you don't want to dive into there because it could be kind of weird. So you could do that. You could email your people, put it in your Facebook group. Hey, let's get on the phone. The first five people respond or send them a link to something like calendly.com, which is something I use for podcast interviews and just send them your schedule and open up a couple days and a couple slots and people can sign up or not sign up. But get on the phone with people and then have some questions and make sure you really listen. Don't fill the space talking a lot yourself leave room for them to say things because that's how you're going to find out a lot more about your people. And even if you only do this for five or 10 people, I would bet you're going to start hearing some similar things. You're going to start hearing the things that draw those people in to read your content. So you can actually talk to them. 
if you don't want to get on the phone or have a Skype call, you can actually talk to your people in something like a Facebook group. And I have been a huge fan of utilizing Facebook groups. I have a great one for this podcast and shout out to all of my community members. If you want to join the Facebook community for the Creative Writing Podcast, You can find that at creativewriting.com forward slash community. And I have a fantastic community manager, Matt McCarrick, who has been killing it, leading some really great discussions and having threads where we all just talk. And I really love it. And I think other people do too. There were like 51 comments on one of the ones from this week. So yay, Matt, for asking great questions. And yay, everybody for talking. And that's a really great way to get to know your people is if you have a Facebook group, And this could work on your page, but I think groups, it it has more community to it, just kind of automatically. But you can listen, you can ask questions, you can talk to your people within that group. You could also do something like Blab, have a public or private. I think if you're going to try to get to know your actual readers, have a private Blab, send out the link just to those people. And you can actually, you know, in Blab, people can hop on, make sure they have earphones so you don't get that crazy echo, but people can actually hop on video and other people can watch and leave comments and ask questions that'd be a really great way to get to know your community people. So you can actually talk to them. And again, there's a number of ways you could do this, but actually talking to them, this is a really intimate step. And I think it really would help even though it's not getting kind of the massive numbers a survey might. Now, as you go through this process, you may find that your current does not match up with your ideal readers that you profiled and created and sort of defined in episode 47 of the podcast using my awesome free guide. So what do you do and why does this happen? So I mentioned before when I surveyed my readers, I found out that they did not care about writing and blogging. Part of the reason that this happens is, you know, many of us have been online for a long time. My Kirsten Oliphant blog used to be still hate pickles because I hated pickles and I hate pickles. I hate pickles, they're disgusting, hate them. And I've hated them my whole life. And people kept telling me when I got pregnant, I would love them. So I got pregnant and still hated them. So still hate pickles was my blog. And it was all about pregnancy. And you can kind of see where I'm going to go with this. But I had been blogging about parenting and my family and being very personal and intimate about family stuff for years. I mean, literally like probably five years. And then all of a sudden I start talking about writing. No wonder my current readers were confused and it didn't fit with them because for years I had been establishing what I blogged about and it was not writing and blogging. So you may have been around for a long time and you have a new interest, you have a new focus, you have a new why. And so it doesn't match up with what your readers expect or the readers that you have built. Also, sometimes we don't know ourselves very well. Like if you start blogging and you are not really clear with your focus, you don't have a clear why, sometimes you just are shotgunning stuff. You're tossing a bunch of stuff out there and you're not hitting a target. I think when you lack focus, you sometimes don't attract a focused audience. You have people kind of all over the board. And it was a conscious choice to me to continue blogging about all kinds of things on the Kirsten Oliphant blog, even though people always say to niche down. And that advice makes so much sense because in some ways it'd be so much easier if I didn't have people, you know, answering my survey questions like, we love your posts about faith. We hate your posts about faith, you know, all over the board about things because I write all over the board. But you may, if you are haphazard in that. And and again, I made a conscious choice not to rule things out. The only thing I took out was writing a blogging and made a separate blog for that. But if you're making a conscious choice, you're going to be more targeted with your people. Even if you're making a more diverse choice, I still found something common that would run through all those posts so that I was attracting the people that really liked my voice, kind of no matter what I was writing. And in the surveys, that was something I found too, is that a lot of people said they didn't care what I wrote, they just wanted to read it. And so that was really encouraging to me as a writer that people were not so interested, they weren't coming to my blog. And my and these were more my kind of like, I guess my more committed readers that they didn't care so much about the content. So I do have people that come once from Pinterest and then leave, and they clearly are interested in whatever that post was. But And people who read and come back and come back wanted to hear the stories. So anyway, you may have started without a lot of focus. You may have started years ago and you've decided you want to change what you write about. Now, if you're struggling with this, I do want to recommend a mini course that I have created called the Foundation Series. And I did this a while back. I did three out of the four workshops live. And basically the first one helps you understand the purpose, the why, I guess, behind your blog 
And then you're going to get the why behind your email list, the why behind your images, and the why behind your social media. And what the foundation series does is it really helps you kind of define that why, which again, I feel just like I just harp on that every single week. But without that, you really do lack the vision. And then how to apply that why to your blog, your images, your social media, and your email list so that all of those things form one whole. Most of us do not start blogging that way. And I think that's a big reason that some of us don't meet that target audience that we really want. We have this other random audience because we're not being intentional. Now, another reason is because sometimes we don't know ourselves very well. Sometimes you need that outside look. Like we think this is what we're writing about. This is who we're attracting. And you really need another set of eyes to tell you like, no, actually that's not who you're attracting. And I've talked to people before. I have a, I don't do a ton of coaching, but I do what I call brand audits where I basically kind of like the foundation series, except I'm personally applying it to you. I go look at, uh, you tell me what your vision is and your purpose is. And then I look at your entire platform and give you feedback. Uh, and sometimes I've found people will say, this is who I'm trying to attract. And I go in and I have to kind of gently break it to people and say, like, that's not who you're attracting. Like Those people are going to read this and be turned off, actually. And so sometimes we just don't know ourselves very well. And we think we have this target on lock and we think we know what we're saying and how to attract them. And we're just wrong. And so you just kind of need other people sometimes to give you eyes. Whatever the reason it's happening, it is common. I talk to people all, all, just all the time who have this problem. So here are three options to deal with that. If you have current audience members who do not match up with your ideal, especially if it's the big bulk of your current audience members. So the first option is kind of cold. It's forget the current readers. Don't think about them at all and just write for your ideal. So your current readers may tell you in a survey that they really just want to read more recipe posts and you're like, screw it. I want to talk about parenting. And so you may drive off. And actually, ideally, you would drive off those people because you don't want those people there. It's kind of like talking about your email list, how you want to keep it warm. And when people unsubscribe, it means that you have successfully turned them off because they're not your ideal readers. Same thing with your blog, that you could just ignore all, like take that information, like, okay, here's who my current readers are, but I just don't care because this is what I want to write about. You're making an intentional choice to alienate people. I would not recommend this audience, this option, if you have a huge audience, because you are just destroying your audience. And this could be a great choice, especially if you're just starting out and you are getting your feet wet and you don't have a huge audience. But if you're getting, you know, like 25, 30,000 page views a month or upward, and those people want to read about X, Y, Z, don't give them ABC. That just doesn't make sense. You don't want to get rid of all of those readers. So this is an option if you really don't care, if you really just are like, no, I don't want to do it. And I know I heard um, Jason Zook, who is kind of a crazy entrepreneur, and he did a whole thing where he would he took in sponsors to wear their t-shirts every day. And just a real creative, interesting guy. And he actually deleted an entire email list of like, 10 or 15,000 people because he just wasn't interested in doing that anymore. And he knew that he wanted a new audience. And so he built from scratch, which makes me have heart palpitations. But in any case, this is an option you may want to do. It's the extreme. Option number two is to slowly transition your current readers into your ideal. You will still drive away people like you did in option one, but more slowly and more gently. So this is kind of hand-holding those people into the new. And this kind of maybe takes some strategic movement on your part. Maybe you start adding in one post a week that is more what you want to write, that's more attractive to that ideal, and then slowly phase out something else. But this is just a more slow transition. You still you want to drive off those people who aren't your ideal, but you might be able to convert them into your ideal. Some you won't, some you will. So this is just sort of a more slow transition where you are going to methodically start writing in a way or start using content, whatever the big change is or the shift needs to be, it's going to be more gradual, but the end result will be the same. But you may not tick people off so much. So you may actually retain some of those current readers and they may become your ideal. And then option three, actually, I guess there's four options. So option three is you write for your current readers and let them be your ideal. So you may come up with this ideal reader profile that's awesome, but then you go into your survey and you go and talk to your people and you have a really awesome group of readers. You have a fantastic 
committed bunch of people and they want to hear about something that's not what your target that you created, that target profile is. And you may just toss the target out the window and decide my current readers are my target. And I'm going to toss aside kind of the why that I had, and I'm going to redefine and kind of pivot based on who is reading. And this is kind of a weird decision, but sometimes a really, really smart one because you may be beating your head against the wall trying to make some kind of Christian mom blog when that's not what your people want from you. And they're there for other things and they're committed. They're there to read it. And it's something else that you want to write about. And that's really the big thing because, it again, it comes back to your why. So if you're just blogging to make money and get page views, then you absolutely, if you have a big group of current readers and you're, they don't match up with your target, screw the target and use the current. They are your new target because they're already there and they're going to bring in that traffic. They're going to bring in the money because they're already there. Now, if you're writing because it's a passion project, then you have kind of a decision to make. So is it smart to let your current write readers be your ideal? Maybe, maybe not. You have a little bit more of a choice, I think. It makes a lot more sense practically if your goals are more you know, money-oriented, traffic-oriented to stick with your current if you have a big audience and they're different than what you had dreamed about. But this brings us into option number four, which is start a new blog. That doesn't mean you have to ditch your old one, but again, this is kind of what I did with creative writing. My current readers of kirstenolfin.com did not care about writing. They did not care about blogging except for a tiny percentage. So I launched a whole new site because I wanted to talk about those things. I want to talk about them a lot. I'm podcasting about them for heaven's sake. So obviously I want to talk about them. I'm passionate about them. And I knew there were some readers of my blog that would be interested. And so I did promote it there a bit. I do talk about it there some. And then I kind of knew where to find this subset of my audience and I've just continued to grow it. And that's what we'll talk about next week is how to go find those people. So that'll be kind of the last in this series. But that's the fourth option is start a whole new blog and you can either ditch your old blog or run both. And that's fine too. A lot of people do that. I think a lot of people, once they start running one blog, end up running like six because that's the blogger's addiction is you just keep on going. So that fourth option is a really good one to consider if you are really passionate about writing about something and your current readers just don't care because you don't, if you don't want to lose those current readers, if you want to keep them there and you don't want to try to convert them, you just want to keep them where they are, then just start something new. And yeah, that's not as easy as I just made it sound. Starting something new is really hard. And that's the other thing I found. So my, you know, and and this, you know, I hate getting into numbers sometimes, but so just as an example, my page views and my focus for creative writing was not page views. So KirstenOlfin.com, the focus was more on page views. And I do run ads there now. I didn't, I did. And then I didn't now I do again and I'm making, you know, a couple hundred dollars a month on ads, which is great because I have a pretty good uh, chunk of people reading on that blog. And so, but my, uh, let's compare it like this. So my average is somewhere between 30 and 50,000 page views a month. It's not great. It's good. I'm very, I'm happy with it. If it's more, that's great, but I'm not a full-time blogger. I'm not putting my full effort. I'm posting maybe once a week. I'm happy with that. So my email list for that is Around 1,500, I keep going in and deleting big chunks. It was almost 2,000, and then I went and deleted a whole bunch of people who weren't reading enough. So my open rate is used to be 30%. Now it's dropped to 20. So it's it's not great. I don't have a fully engaged audience, but I do have people who read, and I do have people who respond to my email. Creative writing, the page views are like 2,000 a month. It's really low. But my email list has now grown to over 3,000 people. So I have put a lot of stock and focus into the email list. And I have put a lot of stock and focus into my Facebook group. And we have, I think, 400 something members now, which is fantastic. And people really do talk. So I have built a community, but it's not about the page views. And I mentioned that just because I think it's really important to note that I'm not just, I'm I'm building something more than just a website, I guess, is is what I want to say about that. And so I can still do both things. They look very different from one another, And they're both serving different purposes. It's fantastic that I just can post what I want about parenting and recipes and everything else and get a couple hundred bucks a month, you know, more if I did sponsored posts, which I used to do, but I didn't like it. So I stopped. 
And then I create a writing, I don't have a huge amount of traffic because that's not really the goal. I want to have great content. I would love it if more people came. And that is something I'm working towards. But at the same time, my real goal is to have these deep relationships with people and create content that matches their needs. And I'm doing that. So that's fantastic. Okay, so I'm exhausted. It's almost 1 a.m. And I hope this episode has been really helpful for you in terms of thinking about your current audience and then what to do if your current doesn't match your ideal. If you are just listening for the first time, you really should go back and listen to episodes 46 and 47. It's not that you have to know that information to get things out of this. Clearly, hopefully you got something out of it if you're still listening 40 minutes in. But you, they're helpful because you really have to know that why, because it's going to keep coming up every, every, every week. And then creating that ideal reader profile, you're not going to know if your current matches your ideal if you haven't created one. So take the time to go back to episodes 46 and 47. Episode 47 is really short, but the freebie is fantastic. So go to this week's episode, createifwriting.com forward slash 048, where you are going to find all of this in print form and also some great links to resources for how to create surveys, other helpful information, dashboard junkie, And take some time to really dive down deep and figure out who your current readers are. Because before we move on to finding your ideal, you want to make sure you know your ideal because you could learn more about your current and then throw out your ideal reader profile and stick to your current or decide you need to start a totally new blog. So before we go finding your new readers or finding where your readers are, you need to know your current readers. So that's going to wrap up this episode of Creative Writing. I'm so glad you guys listen. I'm so thankful to Jasmine Commerce of jasminecommercemusic.com for the music on this show. Please join our community, creativewriting.com forward slash community. You're going to find great conversations. You can share questions and share wins that we have and just really get real. It's not a place to go and just drop links to your stuff. We talk about that weekly because sometimes that happens where people just... I think you might like this blog post. I'm like, well, no, we may not, because that's not, we may not be your target audience for that. That's not what we do there, but we talk a lot. And I think it's really helpful. You can also join my email list where you're going to get an email every Thursday with great resources and links called the quick fix. And you can join that by going to createifwriting.com forward slash subscribe. I am still planning to do some free trainings coming up this month, one on Pinterest basics. So if you're just starting out, you haven't started Pinterest, you want to figure it out. And I've had some guys say, hey, I'm a dude, help me figure out how to use Pinterest. We are going to cover all that, but I don't know when yet, because again, summer's kicking my butt, y'all. So if you sign up to my email, you will find all the information about that and get the emails about my live training workshops. All that being said, I'm out. I need to go to sleep. Thank you guys for listening, and I hope you have an inspired week. Oh.